All right, here we go. This is going to be a bit of a longer video, uh, but since I'm covering six different perspectives um, Christians have on the end times, how they look at the book of Revelation, what they think about things like the millennium, uh, not the millennium falcon. <laughs> We're talking about the thousand year reign of Christ, uh, the second coming, the tribulation, the rapture, that kind of thing. I'm going to put timestamps down below after this whole thing's over, just kind of getting you the six you know, starting points for the different views. Um, so we're going to be covering those six different ways that Christians view the end times and how they interpret the book of Revelation. They're often identified as I give you like our little intro part here. This is good information to have, help bring clarity. By the way, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let you guys know, this is going to be a little bit more advanced. I can't um, avoid certain terms and terminologies as I'm talking about these things. And so it might be a little bit of a challenge, but I do hope that I bring a lot more clarity than confusion here. But I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that if you've never heard some of these views before, you, you you may just this first time around say, okay, I sort of understand that view. Maybe I need to watch again or read a book about it or something to get it better. And that's okay. That's all right. We we can learn. We can be learners here. So <clears throat> the um, the views themselves are often identified in general by you know their attitude towards the millennium, towards the millennium, this thousand year reign of Christ that we read about in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. It's only in that one place in the book of Revelation that it's identified as a thousand years. And there are those who are uh, going to say, hey, is the millennium a past thing? Is it a present thing that's happening now? Or is it a future thing that's going to yet happen one of these days? And so the next question they're going to ask is, and, and when does Jesus return? Does he come before that millennium or does he come after that millennium? And so these attitudes turn into different sort of titles for views of eschatology or views of the end times for Christians. Premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. That's kind of like our starting point for the groups we're going to cover today. And then a couple of these are going to break into other groups. Um, anyway, you'll see as it goes. Hopefully I'll bring clarity. Oh, I hope so. This is, this is challenging stuff to talk about because we're dealing with not only an entire book of the Bible revelation, but we're dealing with massive sections of large portions of the Old Testament. And that turns into a complicated issue. So try to make it as simple as possible. The goals today are this. Clarity. Clarity. That's the hardest one. I hope to bring clarity um, that you can understand these views and not from a biased perspective. It's true that I have my own agenda in the sense of like I have my view. But I hold my view very loosely and I don't want to push that view on others. In fact, if you're thinking, I really just want to know what Mike's view is of the end times because that's going to be my view automatically because I just trust him. I'm going to encourage you, if you trust me, trust me when I tell you this, don't do that. Don't do that. My, if, you want to, if you want to just borrow my view, my view is that I hold my view fairly loosely because I could, I could be wrong and I could understand more, read more, put it together in a different fashion and go, oh, I'm now a different view and, and I'm okay with that. So that's the, the third goal there is, is humility. I didn't, I skipped the second goal, which is unity. Um, I, I want us all to be humble about these things, but also that creates unity. It gives us a sense of unity in the body of Christ. I don't need to divide from you or be suspicious of you. If you are a premillennial, postmillennial or amillennial Christian, there's only one view that I think is very suspicious. We will talk about that. That is called full or hyper preterism. And pretty much everybody else says, guys, that's heresy. And we'll talk about that as well because um, that's significant. There are things all these views have in common, all the Christian views have in common, and that would be Jesus's future bodily return, that there really is an eternal kingdom on its way, and there's an actual bodily resurrection for the saints where we're going to live and dwell in that eternal kingdom with God forever. So there's a glorious, perfect eternity coming. All three views and the sub views, which will turn into six views today, um, well, five of them all agree on that. The one, hyperpreterism, does not. That's enough of an intro. Let me dig into the first one today. That is post-millennialism. The post-millennial, who I'm not at all trying to, to demonize or misrepresent here. Forgive me if you're post-millennial and I don't represent your view. Even within each of these views, there's, there's differences. There's some people who hold it this way. Some people hold it that way. Some people have nuances. So I'm trying to give you a general representation of them all. But in general, post-millennials, they think that Jesus is returning at the end of the millennium. So the thousand years, which is not a literal thousand years, but this this long season of, of Christ reigning, that that is something that happens, uh, him reigning from heaven. And then at the end of that thousand years, he comes to earth bodily. And so all of the stuff that we're waiting on next in, you know, big earthly changes, those things are all going to happen at the second coming of Christ. That's when our, you know, 
what some would call a rapture type thing happens, right? Where we, where we're caught up and we're, we're transformed, where the dead, those who are alive are transformed, the, those who have died in Christ are raised. Um, all resurrections and judgments and good and bad things all happen right then. And then the eternal kingdom begins. So the post millennial millennial person thinks that the tribulation period, um, what a lot of us are familiar with, like the um, seven year tribulation stuff, you know, where that's kind of like what the, the pre-millennialists often are thinking about and talking about as a future event. Well, to the post-millennialist, that's a past event. The tribulation happened a long time ago. Like this stuff was like before 70 AD, it, it all happened. In fact, it, it, the most intense part of this stuff was the last three years between 67 and 70 AD. Because there's like, and you've got to know this, there's like an important historical event that happened in 70 AD, if you're not familiar with it. It's the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus himself talked about this when he was talking about future prophecy. He talks about the destruction of the temple. And they're like, guys, we, what the rest of the people don't realize is that all that tribulation stuff, it was all about the stuff that was going to happen in Jerusalem. So the millennium, since the tribulations already happened, the millennium is already going on right now. Or to some uh, post-millennialists, it's going to happen soon, like sometime eventually. We, maybe we're in the middle of it, or maybe we're like working our way towards it. But the nature of the millennium is the is us Christianizing the world, not only with the gospel, but a sort of political, you know, Christian kingdom that dominates the planet. So they're looking, you know, so whereas say the premillennial, they're often looking for a doom and gloom sort of one world government that's like really bad news for everybody. The postmillennialist is is actually thinking that we're kind of going to have a Christian version of that, and um, this can lead to abuses. But but most postmillennials probably are not not heading down that path. But that's their view of the millennium. It's happening now, and we Christianize the world. So this does change the way that they view the world. They're very optimistic. They do think Satan is currently bound. The post-millennial view, the binding of Satan happened beginning with Jesus's earthly ministry, where he talks about the strong man being bound. And then Satan has already been bound, as you read about this in Revelation. That happened a long time ago, guys. Um, so you're like, well, how's, how's he bound? The premillennialist is going to be like, well, that's kind of a, he's got a long leash, you know, but the post-millennialist can make a case for the binding of Satan. They could say, and the amillennial person later will talk about, will do the same thing, and they'll say, look, you know, before the death and resurrection of Christ, God's work was primarily among the Jewish people. But Christ comes, he binds the enemy, so to speak. The death and resurrection happens, and the gospel goes out to the nations. And now while there are many people who don't believe, the gospel is, and the knowledge of God has spread throughout the world. So the binding of Satan isn't like a, he's totally bound, right? But it's it's that, that sort of worldwide delusion against God that he he had sort of a monopoly on. In, at the first century has ended and now the gospel goes out and you know billions of people would name the name of Christ. So that would be their view on that. Um, maybe you take that view. That's fine. I'm cool with that. I just want people to understand what the view is. So yeah, it's a very optimistic perspective on things. The post-millennialist tends to be very optimistic. If people talk about the end times like, man, it's, they're good times. Then um, they may be post-millennial. Most likely they are. Of all the views, the post-millennial is the most immediately optimistic. Every view is tremendously optimistic when it comes to the eternal kingdom because the second coming of Christ happens and boom, pure optimism at that point. And every view, all the views hold that except for preterism, which is full preterism, which is heresy. Um, we'll talk about that too. Um, so yeah, the the potential problem with postmillennialism, a critique is that it does lead to potentially uh, people trying to set up theocracies you know, trying to take over kingdoms, world governments, and run them with, uh, you know, running them with, say, the Old Testament law being, like, adapted and enforced in a Christian perspective, that kind of thing. And this this can and has caused problems historically. And I don't hold this view. So my view of our in involvement and interaction with government is influenced by me not being post-millennial. Whereas someone's present view of, I mean, I do want to be involved in government, but but only in a different way than perhaps some post-millennials would. So yeah, you could see that. Um, I think, um, well, I don't want to name too many names because I do think Bethel would would probably be post-millennial in their perspective. I'm pretty sure like Bethel is. And they would take it into a realm of like, uh, use the word realm, into a place of, of being something like, um, uh, we're going to spread over the seven mountain mandate. We're going to spread into the world. And then then you might think that post-millennial is like some hyper charismatic thing. But, but no, I mean, there's plenty of very sober-minded, forgive me, you guys, I'm not trying to be mean here. <laughs> I just want you to understand the scope of, of different people who are post-millennial. Um, sober-minded people who are, who are not like that at all, 
who still are post-millennial in their perspectives and um, they're, it's not tied to hyper-charismatic views. Um, more often, charismatics tend to be premillennial, actually. So let's talk about how post-millennialists view the book of Revelation because each of these views I'm going to deal with today, they all have like a different sort of grid they'll place on the book of Revelation. And it's kind of like a decoder ring, right? you know, the old decoder ring, like you'd, you'd swing, like in some of them, you'd swing like this little colored lens over a bunch of text that was hard to read or impossible to read. And it would, it would blot out or, or cover certain parts and highlight others. And you would suddenly be able to read it. Um, in advanced versions of this, you might have multiple colored circles. You could pull over lenses you could, you could use. Um, well, Think of it like this, these different these different views of the end times have different sort of grids or decoder rings they put on the book of Revelation. And very quickly, if you have their view of Revelation, you realize, oh, that's why they think the way they do. It's the way they look at Revelation. Sometimes it's, it's the presuppositions they bring to the text. And this is probably the case for all views, uh, mine own included, right? That it's, it's only as strong as my presuppositions about the book of Revelation is the view itself. Well, the post-millennialist, what they're going to do is look at the book of Revelation as a preterist. Um, now, this is not the bad kind of preterism. This is a general, no, more normal preterism that I would consider my brothers and sisters in Christ are preterists. Um, I, I think like Apologia Studios looks at the text this way through, say, preterism. That's I mentioned this because we're on YouTube here and they're very well known. And... Um, and that's maybe they're right. I mean, they might be right. Like maybe I'll change my mind at some point and I'm open to that. But they would say that most of the book of Revelation, most of it, I mean, the vast majority of the book of Revelation was all fulfilled by 70 AD. So remember I talked about the tribulation happening right there at the time, right before the destruction of the temple, right? They look at the vast majority. In fact, uh, one preterist I spoke with said that the, the point in the book where he says, boom, now we're in future prophecy is Revelation 20, verse 6. Like, that's the point where it shifts. I'm going to share it with you guys on screen now. I did warn you today is going to be a longer teaching, right? Well, it will be. All right, Revelation 26. Uh, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death will have no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And, and they're viewing this as happening now. And everything in Revelation, at least in some, some preterist and post-millennial views, everything in Revelation up till 20 verse 6 already happened. Then verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended, it being a symbolic time that's happening right now, when that's over, when this season's over, then there is going to be this brief release of Satan who's going to be deceiving the nations. There's going to be a final judgment and the second coming. And then there is uh, the eternal kingdom. So that's that's their view on the thousand years is happening now. Now, when they look at Revelation, um, you'd have to understand if, if you look at it from a premillennial perspective, as, as I always have, you're like, this is ridiculous. That's what you think. This is ridiculous. The, the preterist thinks all this stuff already happened. Like worldwide destruction, fourth of the earth is killed. Like what? But their decoder ring that they're putting on top of the book of Revelation, it, and, and it's, it's not without warrant. It's not like they can't try to build a case for it because they can't. But the ring would be to say, hey, when you see world, it's talking about Israel. Right? It doesn't mean always the whole world. When when you see the judgment upon you know all the nations, what you're really looking at is judgment upon the tribes of Israel. When you when you see things that look global in the book of Revelation, they're very much centered in Israel in the Middle East. And so they're going to constantly look at things like that. The destroying of the trees of the earth is just the trees in Israel. Um, not all the tribes of the earth are mourning. It's the tribes of Israel that are mourning, as they did in 70 AD, and the destruction of the temple came. Everything seems a lot smaller from the preterist perspective, and that's why they can find fulfillment in a very, you know, crazy and hard event that happened in around 70 AD, the Jewish war uh, with Rome and their terrible loss in that battle, prolonged loss in that battle. So the, the other thing they're going to put in their decoder ring, not only is it focused on Israel and not the world, all that stuff up till Revelation 20 verse um, 7, but they're also going to be saying that they look at Revelation as something that's called apocalyptic literature. Now you're, you're like, apocalypse, that means, I mean, Revelation is an apocalypse. Like literally the word apocalypse means revealing or unveiling. And Revelation is just a synonym for that. But we're not, we're not using the term like that. When you're talking about a genre of literature, 
apocalyptic is a genre that some would say Revelation fits into, where it, it has these certain categories and certain style of writing. And long story short, when you say apoc Revelation's apocalyptic literature, what you really probably mean by that is it's poetic hyperbole. Poetic hyperbole. Now, poetic hyperbole exists. We have poetic hyperbole with like, when I, one of my favorite examples is in the Psalms when David says, I make my bed swim with tears. And, and you're like, well, his bed's not swimming. His, his room is not literally flooded with his tears. It's poetic hyperbole. Everyone knows that. So you interpret it as he's in great sorrow. He keeps crying. It's not lying. It's not deceptive. And in their view, like Revelation is not, not exaggerating wrongly. This is just normal apocalyptic language for, you know, elevating the language of destruction so that you could see the, the spiritual magnitude of it when God's destroying the temple where his presence once was because now he's working in the church. It's judgment upon Israel for having rejected their Messiah. So they're looking at it through that lens. So when you say, oh, it's about Jerusalem and Israel, and you add the other lens of like, oh, it's apocalyptic genre, it becomes a lot easier to find fulfillments in 70 AD. In chapter 19, or, or oh, I should mention this. Um, another important thing in Preterism, in my view, as I understand it, is Revelation 6 through 18, where it talks about the, the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. These, these three consecutive judgments, they're not viewed as consecutive in Preterism. The Preterist view, or the post-millennial view, is going to say that these are overlapping things. So the trumpets, the seals, and the bowls all happen at the same time. That they're all happening at the same time. And so there's what they call recapitulation or the repetition of the same the same things. You're you're basically it's like you're you're looking at a scene. It's described as seven trumpets. You look at the same scene again, historically speaking. It's described as um, or for seals, trumpets, bowls. It's described in in those orders, but it's the same scene viewed three times through different um, apocalyptic language. That would be their view of those things. Um, that is important, I think, for the preterist view of to, because if you're going to try to find fulfillment for all those things in 70 AD, you're going to need them to be repetitive and not consecutive. We will talk about some specific examples of where they see stuff being fulfilled in 70 AD. And you might be surprised because the post-millennial, they, there's reasons why people hold this view, right? They're not, they're not just off, out to lunch, right? It's not like they just don't believe the Bible. Like, please don't do this. Like if you're pre-millennial like I am, don't do this to them. There are intelligent and thoughtful reasons why they built a the case for this view. There's reasons why people are, I would say right now, increasingly holding this view. All of these views have trends. They go up and down. I'd say right now it's more of in, in a growth trend, post-millennial views. Now, um, chapter 19, uh, it's the coming of Christ to complete the judgment of Jerusalem. Now, chapter 19 in Revelation, you'd think this is the coming of Christ. Period, like premillennials. I'm speaking because most of you guys are premill, so I'm going to talk to you like you are because most of you are. Um, it is the most popular view. Well, at the end of Revelation 19, um, we read about the coming of the of Christ, and he's riding on a white horse. Right? I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on, written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the Word of God. Clearly, it's Jesus, and he's coming in in judgment. This is a wrath judgment coming. He is clothed in, um, oh, sorry, verse fourteen. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and purple, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And nations, they would probably say, well, this is more, more about Israel. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. Now, not all of them will say that, but some will. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Almighty God. And, and it just goes on. This, this coming, this coming for this great judgment moment is viewed as already having happened for, I think, most preterists, most premillennial people. They're like, Jesus, in Revelation, the coming of Revelation 19 isn't really the second coming of Christ. It's a coming or a return of Christ to Israel for judgment. He doesn't really come to the earth in like his return, like Acts talks about in the same way in which he left till return. This is a, a different issue altogether. So most of us would probably view Revelation 19 as Jesus. It's his future second coming. They would say, no, 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 that was a 70 AD coming of Christ. This is probably one of the weaker spots of the preterist argument. But there are stronger spots of the argument. And the preterist does still believe there's a future second coming in Revelation 20 through 22. It talks about all that. Currently... Um, 
the um, the thing that surprises me the most about preterism, whenever I do look into it, I have over the years a few different times, is how good they are at finding quotes from Josephus, a first century historian who's not a Christian, right? A Jewish Roman historian. They're finding quotes from him that look like they do correspond with the book of Revelation. And it's kind of surprising how good they are at this. You're like, there's no way you're going to find a quote for that. And yet they do, and they do it really well, but not good enough in my opinion. But let me, let me explain what I mean so you can at least appreciate why some hold this view. In um, Revelation 6.14, we read about mountains being removed during the sixth seal. I'll put the text up on the screen for you. Revelation 6.14, it says, The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So what is this? Every mountain and island, um, you know, a primo would say, like, obviously that hasn't happened. <laughs> you know? I mean, even if it's not literally every mountain and island, but this is maybe this is describing like kind of like a worldwide cosmic events that everybody would notice. Um, it didn't happen in 70 AD. But to the preterist, they would say, and this is a historical preterist. This is the non-heretical preterist. Uh, they would say that the mountains being removed in the sixth seal, it's the Roman workmen who were leveling roads for horsemen to travel unhindered to attack Jerusalem. Remember, every mountain is talking about Israel, not the world. And the leveling of mountains, well, from a, even from an Old Testament and, and New Testament perspective, mountains were seen as the protection for the nation. It's hard for armies to cross mountains. You build your cities on a mountain. Leveling a mountain could be removing your protection against the armies of Rome. And Josephus, in, like I mentioned quoting Josephus, he really does record that Roman soldiers did level the roads and they also built ramps to get over the walls of the cities of Israel. So they go, oh, do so you see how they're lens? Oh, it's about, it's about Israel. It's, it's about 70 AD. We have historical quotes from Josephus. It's, it's, it does come together, at least somewhat. Uh, Revelation 6, verses 15 through 16. Then I'm just reading now the very next section, next couple of verses from what I read before. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? Now you might see this as global and it, and it is kings of the earth plural. That would... You might think that's the that's the global. It's great ones and generals and rich and powerful and everyone, slave and free. But they're going to suggest this is more focused on Israel. So these are like leaders of Israel. These are the people of Israel. And they'll quote Josephus again. And Josephus does record that in that time, what they'll call the Great Tribulation between 67 and 70 AD, leading up to the destruction of the temple, that people were actually hiding underground in caves in Israel and around Jerusalem, hiding from the Roman troops, that they were like hiding there, that they were just terrified and hiding. So you might say, well, that there, there seems to be some correspondence, but it seems like it's a little, it falls short. And that would be, you know, my analysis of it. But um, let me give you another one. And I'll actually read to you from Josephus because I think it's pretty interesting. Here's Revelation 9, verse 14. I'm going to read this to you and I want you to think, how on earth are they going to find this in 70 AD or thereabouts? <laughs> and then I'll tell you how they do it. Revelation 9, 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops, and it shifts from angels to troops, so that it related somehow, was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. Now, what is this possibly about? Well, let me read you a quote. This is directly from Josephus. Josephus is not a preterist, okay? He's not a Christian. Um, he says this in his uh, book, The Jewish Wars, in uh, 653, if you're looking for the specific um, chapter paragraph reference. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. Now, he's describing what happened right, you know, at the edge of the destruction of the, um, of the temple and of Israel. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those who saw it. And were not the events that followed of it followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before the setting sun, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. This is also quoted by Tacitus, who may have gotten it from Josephus, or maybe maybe he heard from some other source. But the idea is that there, he's reporting here. He's, you can't say he's biased, right? He's, or in the sense of being a preterist. He's reporting that there were 
visions of these angelic armies surrounding the cities before their destruction. And that kind of would work with Revelation 9, right? I mean, there's a, it's interesting, at least. You could at least say it's interesting. Um, now, as far as the angels being at the river Euphrates, they would say, well, the, at least some preterists would say, the river Euphrates touches Syria. And, and here's a little bit of stretching. Syria, where the U river Euphrates touches, where these angels were kept, happens to be where four Roman legions were also kept. So there's four angels, there's four Roman legions. The angels are kind of like, anyway, do you find some correspondence? The question is, and every preterist has to ask this, is some correspondence enough correspondence? Is this coincidental or is it perhaps partial or is this actually the real fulfillment of this thing? In some places, um, <laughs> it's interesting because preterists would be equally confident and in, you know, in one passage, in, in one in particular, Revelation 13, they can be very confident about Nero and then totally in confusion about the second beast, <laughs> which is the false prophet. So if you're familiar with Revelation, great. If not, I'm sorry, I'm not going to explain it in great detail because, again, 22 chapter book, um, it's just too much to cover when I'm covering six different perspectives. But their view is that Nero is the beast. And the mark of the beast, the 666, is, is a... Um, what's gemat gematria is what it's called but it's a, it's a hebrew way of doing numbers it's not weird okay this is like really how they did numbers um they used hebrew letters to symbolize different numbers what might be weird to some is that they would take nero caesar that name not his whole name nero caesar augustus Diblicicus, or whatever i forget his full name so they're not going to take his his whole name sorry someone's trying to call me denied um <laughs> sorry it's driving nuts if it just keeps buzzing on me um, so they'll take Nero Caesar and they'll take specifically a Hebrew spelling of Nero Caesar that turns it into Neron Caesar, which may or may not be the most likely way of spelling. But what's trippy about it is that it really does equal 666. Like you can get from Neron Caesar 666. And then to add more confusion to this, <laughs> here's the true story. There are, um, there is an ancient reading in a, in a church father that suggests that Revelation should read 616. Now, that has kind of puzzled people for years until they found an actual ancient papyrus or an ancient manuscript or really just a piece of Revelation that actually had the Mark of the Beast as 616. Why is that significant? Well, it's probably not the original reading. It, it, most, I don't know anybody if anybody thinks it is. What's interesting is that some copyist did put 616 and it seems like they did it on purpose. Well, the preterist would say the reason they did that is because while Nero Caesar or Neron Caesar is in Hebrew 666, Nero Caesar in Greek equals 616. And this copyist, they would theorize, he deliberately changed it to 616 because he realized his audience reading this copy of, of Revelation didn't know Hebrew as well as John's original audience. So he makes sure that they'll get the message that this is about Nero. Um... I mean, that's a pretty interesting argument. Um, they'll, they could even point to how the beasts, this beast, this, you know, someone called the Antichrist, he persecutes for 42 months in particular, 42 months of major, major persecution. Well, Nero did do 40, about 42 months of major persecution from the time of his, his just intense hatred of Christians in particular. He put them on, he dipped them in tar, put them on torches, set them on fire. I mean, horrible things and just horrible persecution until he killed himself was forced to kill himself, the story goes. And um, so, yeah, that's interesting. So all that to say, like Revelation 13, the first beast, it's like, wow, preterists have like a strong case for that being Nero. They really do. Maybe it's right, maybe it's not. But when it comes to the second beast, it's an example of where preterism does have problems. Because it's if you look at Revelation and you only gather the passages that look like they do have connections to Josephus or other things like that, preterism looks very strong. But what I've noticed in preterist commentaries is they often only present the strong passages and then they pass over the weak passages, the ones they don't have good preterist interpretations for, with no commentary. So that you won't even know there's a weakness there. And so that can be a problem. It can create overconfidence, I think, amongst some preterists. For example, the second beast of Revelation 13, right after all these neat things about Nero that they think they can connect, the second beast, um, well, he makes everybody worship the first beast. He makes an image of the beast and it can talk Whatever. Now, maybe that's symbolic. It could be apocalyptic, but it's got to mean something. Well, I, I've never even heard a preterist guess at what the talking of the beast is. And I looked and looked and spent way too many hours just on Revelation 13 looking for post-millennial perspectives on it. 
Um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is there's no clear correspondence. Some say the second beast is the Jewish high priestly system. But when did the Jewish high priests make people worship Nero? Like that didn't happen. The Jews had special permission not to worship Nero. So that doesn't really make sense. Some said the mark of the beast is the phylacteries that the Jews would wear. The phylacteries. I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's, that sounds totally far-fetched to me. Others would say it was the Roman emperor's cult. But then they have a hard time explaining how that beast arises out of the land or what the talking of the images or how they were actually not just telling people to worship, but killing those who didn't, right? Where does that happen during the reign of Nero or, or shortly thereafter? Um, it's just difficult for them to find historical correspondence to all of Revelation. It's easy to find for pieces. So I would recommend pay attention to preterist commentaries. There's a lot of details that are just passed over. They just don't, I, I kind of wish I would read a commentary from preterists. So they go, that's interesting. That should have fulfillment. I don't know what it is. Now you can, as a preterist, you could say, I'm post-millennial, I'm preterist. I think there's enough correspondence in Revelation to 70 AD that I'm going to, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to all these other places where I'm not sure where the fulfillment is. You can do that. I'm not going to criticize that. I just want us to be honest about the areas where we don't know. That's it. Um, well, let me see. Here's a weak point for preterism. While there are some strong points, there are some weak points as well. Um, one of them is just the idea that Satan is bound now. I, I do think a lot of people have a hard time really seeing Satan is bound now and is bound ultimately from the from the cross that he's he's bound at that point. Jesus bound him. Yeah, later, there are scriptures that talk about him, uh, him being the God of this age currently and him actively blinding the minds of unbelievers. This is going on years and years after the cross. Now, a response to that is, well, he's bound, but it's like pr the binding is progressively happening, like the effect of it are progressively happening. And so it's not f fully in place or something like that. But that would be a challenge to that view. Um, probably one of the harder challenges to preterism is their view of Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 4, and, and amillennialists are going to share this same issue here. There is a resurrection that's mentioned in Revelation 20. Uh, Premillennialists are going to say this is about the future resurrection. They're going to say this is a spiritual resurrection. The problem with that is, and I'm trying to summarize these things here quickly, but the problem with that is that you've got two resurrections mentioned and they're viewing one as spiritual, one as physical, and you can try to build a case for it, but it's definitely a weak spot in the argument. So let me read the passage and just point a couple things out to give you some insight. Revelation 24, um, this is part that has already been fulfilled in the uh, preterist or post-millennial view and amillennial in a sense depending on what kind of amillennial you are. Uh, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those who to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. Okay, let's talk about those people. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life. And that is a, a, a Greek word, anastasis, that is like a word for resurrection. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now they think this is happening already, right? So they see this as a, uh, symbolic or, you know, spiritual, you know, resurrection, not a, not a literal one. But then verse five says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Okay. But that one they take as being a literal resurrection, literal bodily resurrection. So here you have the same phrase in the same context. One's spiritual, the other one's literal. That is a very weak point. Not only that, there has just been a lot of work on the word resurrection scholarly work done by N.T. Wright, who happens to be post-millennial. He has the view that one's spiritual, one's, one's literal here. Um, and his work on anastasis or um, in his book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, is to suggest, I mean, it's, it's just massive Greek word study on the topic, to suggest that anastasis always means literal, physical resurrection. And so you have to work pretty hard to get a symbolic one there. Um, it's quite a quite odd spot, spot for the view. Now, here's support for preterism. One of the, probably the strongest support for preterism is, well, I'll share it with you right now. The time indicators in the book of Revelation that suggest that these things are supposed to happen soon, um, at least according to the preterist. And this is a strong argument for preterism right here. These are the things, according to Revelation 1-1, that must soon take place. And then... Some think, well, that just means it must quickly, like once it starts happening, it has to happen quickly because it's a short time from the beginning to the end of the events. Well, in verse three, it says, um, for the time is near. <laughs> like, okay, well, the time is near. That does seem to imply that these things are going to happen not only quickly, but they're going to happen soon, relatively soon, like 70 AD would fit. 
Um, you could also go to Revelation 3, or let me, I'll just skip to the here. Revelation 20, 2, verse 10. Jesus says, uh, or the angel, sorry, says to him, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Uh, now in Daniel, when the, when the book is sealed, it's because the time for those fulfillments is very far off. In Revelation, don't seal it because the time is near. I, I think that that is a, is a fair thing to say, look, here's a strong reason to look for early fulfillment. Doesn't mean it clinches the whole deal, but I want to give credit where credit's due. And then again, in Revelation 20, verse 6, these are things that must soon take place. Um, now there's other places where they're also going to mention, you know, things where Jesus is saying that the things, the prophecies are going to come true shortly. I'm not convinced by those. There's a big list like Matthew 26, 64, um, well, all, all through the gospels, um, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. We'll cover this stuff in the Mark series in the next couple of weeks. So I'll go over that more in more detail, but they'll list a bunch of verses. They think suggest that these things have to happen soon, have to happen soon. Um, they're going to look at the Olivet Discourse where Jesus talks about prophecy in the Gospels as having been already fulfilled or at least mostly fulfilled. And there's going to be some debate on how much of it's fulfilled, but but it's pretty much mostly fulfilled at least. It's not just like um, random people who have this view. Like R.C. Sproul is a preterist. He holds the preterist view. Um, Gary DeMar is known. Uh, Gentry, Philip Gentry is one of the major like scholarly proponents of the view as well. There are criticisms of the view. Before we move on to the next one, number two, I told you it's going to be a long video. I'm not kidding. It's going to be long. Um, there's some criticism of um, preterism and postmillennialism that you should be aware of. It's accused of being anti-Semitic uh, because it's like, hey, the church has replaced Israel. The last the last news for Israel is judgment. You, you know, the temple's destroyed. God's kind of done with you. Um, I think that this is unwise. I don't, I would never accuse this view of being anti-Semitic. You can be anti-Semitic and hold this view. My encouragement to Christians is stop it. Please do not try to prove your theology true or your eschatology by saying that, you know, I'm nicer to Jewish people than you are. Like this is not only is that not really true, it's also not how you should establish theology. We don't build our, the unless you're a progressive Christian, <laughs> then, then you may establish your theology based on what feels like the nicest theology to have. Um, and we can't do that. We have to interpret the text. So don't do that. Don't call it anti-Semitic, please. Every debate, it comes up and I'm like, Bleh. Um, Some would say that post-millennialism and amillennialism, that it removes the validity of the book of Revelation. And because it's all been fulfilled. Like, what's the point? If it's not even future, what's the point of the book? Why is it valid for us today? And I think that this is also a bad argument against preterism. Of course, fulfilled prophecy is valid. In fact, I prefer fulfilled prophecy to unfulfilled because it's more clear because you can see the clear historical fulfillment of it. I think it's more exciting to me, just personally speaking here. Please don't invalidate fulfilled prophecy to try to prove your right on eschatology. I will say this, good criticisms of preterism. It seems to stretch symbolism to a breaking point. Um, and the further you get in Revelation, the more you're racking up these things where you're like, oof, that was just like, that was a pretty big stretch for that being fulfilled. Um, however, if they're right about their understanding of apocalyptic genre, which a lot of people would say Revelation's apocalyptic. They may or may not view it as that kind of apocalyptic genre. And, um, you know, if they're right about that, maybe you'll just flip a switch and you'll say, yep. Um, it does look like it downgrades a lot of the content in Revelation. Stuff that looks like it's worldwide is very much just Israel and very, it, it just looks a lot smaller than, than you would have thought if you just read the book by itself. It also seemed to have two comings of Christ, him coming in, in 70 AD in judgment and then coming again finally. And two future comings of Christ are from the perspective of the first coming. Now there's two more coming. And that's a little weird. It does tend to require, tend to require an early date for the book of Revelation. See, for these things to be future, Revelation has to have been written before 70 AD. And um, this is kind of a challenge. Um, most people, and I mean even conservative Christians, like, would say that Revelation was probably written in the 90s, not in the 70s, or excuse me, not in the 60s. Even if it was written in the 60s, it had a very little lifespan of it being predictive, very small period of time there. And so, yeah, that, that um, that's a challenge for this view. Uh, some postmillennialists will say, hey, I don't care if Revelation was written late. It's just recounting what already happened. That's fine. And, and, and maybe they can do that. But I would say the majority that I've heard, they do depend on an early date for Revelation, which seems somewhat unlikely. And... Yeah, the resurrections, the two resurrections I mentioned, that's a problem. And, um, sorry, details tend to be glossed over in preterist commentaries. They tend to just skip the things that don't have an easy first century fulfillment 
and I would consider that crit crit criticism. All right, let's go to our second view. The second view is is related to the first view, um, and this is the heretical one. This is full or hyper preterism. I wish they wouldn't use the term preterism because their view is not really Christian, um, and and I don't, I don't say that to be an insult, right? Like Mormonism is not really Christian. That's not because I'm mad at Mormons or something. Like Christianity is an actual thing, and there are some things that may look similar but not be authentically Christian, like say Mormonism in some in some cases. Um, the theology is Christian, but in essential cases, it's not. And the same here with full or hyper preterism. Hyper preterism would take the preterist view that everything from to Revelation 20 verse 6 has already been fulfilled and they would extend it to the whole book. They would also extend it to basically the entire Bible. Everything in the Bible has been fulfilled. The second coming has already happened. We're living in the eternal kingdom. And this turns into a denial of some central tenets of Christianity. There is no literal resurrection, none, no future resurrection, which it flies in the face of 1 Corinthians 15, flies in the face of, of everything we know about Christianity. There's no actual eternal life. Like we're just living. This is it. Like this is heaven, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, there's no end of death or pain. Um, wars and all this stuff, all the end of all those things has already happened. Jesus has already returned for the last time. It's, it's done. It's over. We are currently living in the new heavens and new earth, which means effectively... By saying all that stuff's fulfilled, we're denying all of those things because they have not been fulfilled. As all Christians would agree, they have not been fulfilled. And so you're just denying that they are going to happen at all and saying that they already happened. We call this heresy because it denies core teachings of scripture. Not only is it not biblical, but it's also not historical. From the earliest creeds of the church, from the and I mean, these are like actual ecumenical creeds like creeds when before there was like a lot of the division that existed later on where it was different groups trying to like you know claim power over the rest of the church and stuff like that we have things like the apostles creed that says that jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead right this is this is long after the time of the apostles the creed that all the christians could agree on is that jesus really is coming back to judge the living and the dead the nicene creed which says and i'll quote he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, his kingdom will never end. That would deny uh, that that creed saying this is what Christianity is. That would deny um, hyperpreterism. Uh, we look forward, they say as well in the Nicene Creed. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Uh, the Didache. Here's something really random. I do worry about how long this video will be, but. Maybe you don't. So the Didache is a first century, probably written around like 95, 98 AD. This thing was probably written around the time of Revelation. And it's not a Bible book, but the Didache is probably, it's, a, it's not that long of a book. You could find it online and read it for free. Just D-I-D-A-C-H-E, Didache. And um, this, this book, it's probably like an instructional book. Like they wanted to, like a new believers packet in a sense, right? Like let's walk you through new believers through these things. It doesn't, it's not authoritative, but it's interesting. Here's what the Didache says. I'll read several verses from the Didache here from chapter 16, verse three through eight. This is what they said. And their view seems to be a premillennial, but the point is that it's an early statement about the belief in the future resurrection, right? Shortly after 70 AD. In other words, the whole church, missed it preterist like full preterist the whole church missed everything that, that you make your view um let me read it to you the decay 16 3 says for in the last days false prophets and seducers shall be multiplied and this and the sheep shall be turned into wolves and love shall be turned into hate they seem to be quoting jesus here from the gospels and because iniquity aboundeth they shall hate each other and persecute each other and deliver each other up and then shall the deceiver of the world appear as the son of god and shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered into his hands, and he shall do unlawful things, such as have never happened since the beginning of the world. Again, this is a this is a premillennial perspective. It doesn't prove premills are right, but this is their their perspective in the Didache. Um, then shall the creation of man come to the fiery trial of proof, and many shall be offended and shall perish, but they who remain in their faith shall be saved by the rock of offense itself. You can hear how they're kind of quoting scripture, like he who endures to the end shall be saved, Jesus says. And then shall appear the signs of the truth. First, the sign of the appearance in heaven. Then the sign of the sound of the trumpet. And thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. Tapping into Jesus. Tapping into the, the, his Olivet Discourse in the Gospels. Tapping into First Thessalonians. Um, tapping into Revelation, First Corinthians, all that. It's all future in, in the perspective of those who affirm the, the contents of the Didache in the first century and second century. Then in verse 7, it says, Not of all... 
But as it has been said, the Lord shall come and his saints with him. That's premillennial, first resurrection, the saints. And then in verse 8, then shall the world behold the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. So um, my point here is that the one view you shouldn't hold is the second one I've covered, which is hyper preterism. This view can be panned by everybody, um, including preterists who rightly use the name preterist. Um, this view should be panned by everybody. Um, arguably, it should have a different title because it denies the real and future bodily return of Christ, the resurrection, and other things that all Christians have always affirmed. Number three, pre-millennial views. This is, again, the view I hold with a loose hand. Forgive me. You may have more confidence about your view than I have of mine. That's fair. I wouldn't, I'm wouldn't. i not criticizing you for it, but I can only be honest about my, my level of confidence, which is not super high <laughs> when it comes to eschatology. Um, one day we'll all know what it means, right? And we'll all know. We'll all be right because it will have happened. The synopsis of the premillennial view is this. The premillennialists, they view that Jesus is going to, in the future, return to the earth. He's going to, at that point, have a thousand-year-long kingdom worldwide reign on earth. The, resur the first resurrection of the saints, of the saved, happens at the beginning of that kingdom. Then a thousand years of great reign. At the end of it, Satan is released. Right? Satan deceives those, those who, are, who can deceive, which we'll get into some more details about why that can be confusing for people. And then... The, the, the final judgment comes and the second resurrection, the final resurrections of the unsaved and for their punishment. Before the thousand year reign, they believe that there is a tribulation coming. This is probably, most of them would say this is a literal seven year period. There's a seven year future period of crazy tribulation that happens right before that millennium begins. So a lot of the premillennialists, they start debating, are we heading into the tribulation? We look at the world around us and we say, hey, is that going to be a one world government that we read about in Revelation? Is that going to be the beast? Is that person going to be trying to institute the mark of the beast? Is this thing going to be the mark of the beast? And this is because they think that the next major thing on the prophetic time scale is the seven years of tribulation. Generally speaking, premillennialists also believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. But there are premillennialists who believe in a this means the rapture of the church, like believers around the world will just be taken up, you know, brought up out of the earth before this seven year tribulation. That's a pre-tribulational rapture. Then there are mid-trib people or pre-wrath rapture people who think it'll happen at about the three and a half year mark. They'll be brought up just before it gets really, really bad for three and a half years. And then there are post-trib who think that we're caught up when Christ returns, we're, we join him in the air and then we come with him down to the earth. Um, I don't have a really hard stance on the timing of the rapture and, um, um, and they do view the binding of Satan as very, very strong. Like Satan, when he's bound during this millennium, this thousand year reign of Christ, like he has no influence of any kind on the earth. Like there's no influence. God is the one governing the world. He's, he's, he's not only God of all things, he's the God of, of the age or of the world at the time. And there are, um, this is where it gets a little tricky. Right? There are people who live through the tribulation, at least on many premillennial views, they live through the tribulation and then they enter into the millennium and they're not saved and they have kids and they populate the earth and, and they may or may not actually be saved. When Satan is released, those are the people ultimately he'll probably deceive. That would be the general, I think, view that's held there. Now, there's, there's kind of like three camps. I'm going to just talk about two of them. So this is going to be um, the, the more common dispensational premillennial camp. I'm going to talk about them for a second. Then there's something called a progressive dispensational camp. And I find myself in that camp tentatively might change my mind. Maybe I'll become a millennial or preterist or something. I don't know. Um, that's possible. I don't like foresee it happen, but I definitely could see the possibility and I'll let you guys know if I change my mind. Uh, you certainly don't have to agree with me on this, but let me talk about the dispensational premillennial views. Then I'll talk about progressive dispensational premillennial views. So we'll consider this three and four of today's six views. Three is dispensational premillennial. Um, both of these are marked in, both views are marked in how literally they take prophecy. They don't, it's a misnomer that they take it woodenly literally. Now some of them may, but they just take it more in a more straightforward fashion than the postmillennialists or especially the amillennialists who we'll talk about later. They have an extremely flexible understanding of the book of Revelation and of prophecy, um, at least from, you know, by comparison to the progressive or 
or just dispensationalist. So yeah, when Revelation uses symbolic language, we see it as symbolic, the premillennialists, but they're also going to say that the symbols are taken in fairly straightforward ways, right? When a fourth of the earth is dying, well, that's very much something a lot like a quarter of, a quarter of the earth dying. Like it's going to be taken fairly straightforward. Um, and one view that's consistent amongst um, dispensational and progressive dispensational premillennial people, <laughs> I'm so sorry because I can feel I'm confusing people, but this is just confusing stuff. I'm doing my best for you. One view that's consistent amongst them is that they will see that Israel and the church are not the same identical thing. Um, so they're thinking that there are these prophecies in the Old Testament and the New Testament about Israel that will be fulfilled in the future in a national sense in Israel. Now let me talk about some more details. The dispensational premillennialist has taken their name because it started with a view on what's called dispensations. This is printed in the Schofield Study Bible. This is what it's famous for. I think it's a total distraction from the eschatological view. Let me mention it briefly and why it's a boogeyman and why people will often deal with dispensational premillennialists. They don't deal with the views. They deal with the boogeyman. So... Let me explain. Um, dispensations is a term referring to different eras of how God structures humans, human history. In Eden, it's an era of innocence. Um, after that, it's an era of conscience. Man has to obey his conscience, but man doesn't. That leads to the flood because man is so wicked. Then you have the area, the era of like civil government. This is after the flood up until Abraham. Um, then you have an era of promise. And then between Abraham and Moses, after Moses, you have the era of the law. Now God's interacting people with the law. Then you have the church age when Jesus comes or the area of grace. Um, then you're going to have the ma next major one coming is the millennium where it's a worldwide theocracy. Now I, I could go on for a week explaining all those different eras, but this is kind of a, a boogeyman because it's not relevant. It's not relevant to the dispensational view of premillennial eschatology. It's just, it's just not relevant. So Schofield in his Schofield Bible that was very, very popular back in the day, and I don't know too many people who use it now. Um, he had a view that was related to dispensations and it had, it held that the Jews kind of had like a works path to God. Like that's what it reads like as you read his commentaries, comments on like, is it John 1 17 or something? It, it looks like the Jews have a path to God through works, which is not at all a biblical teaching and that raises red flags and they're like boom if your eschatology is based on that and all i'm going to say is guys dispensationalists who are pre-millennial nowadays they generally they, the term dispensational applies but they don't focus on dispensations at all many of them prefer to just look at the human history as old covenant new covenant and that's it so we just need to ignore that um the big issue though is that the church has not fully replaced israel even if israel and the church are united in one entity there's still a national identity of Israel that is has prophecies to be fulfilled. That would be the more modern, current um, belief that's influencing premillennial dispensational views. <laughs> Man, I'm, this stuff is so confusing. You just you, it's hard to understand what I'm saying. You go go read what they write. Oof, um, it just gets really complicated and confusing. But hopefully, I'm bringing some clarity. The um, the way that they view the book of Revelation, let's let's talk about how a, a dispensational premillennial person views the book of Revelation. They see it as future. They're, in fact, the term for how they interpret Revelation is futurist. So unlike the preterist view, most of Revelation is fulfilled, it's like, the, it's like the opposite of that. They go, almost all of this stuff has not yet happened. It's going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to have a much more like worldwide application and not just Israel or happening in a local area. It's going to be very much a global thing, the book and the prophecies. They look at Revelation 119 in a very particular way as an outline for the entire book of Revelation. So if you want to know how they view Revelation, it's like this. Jesus tells John, write therefore the things you have seen. Those that are, those that are, that is like a present verb, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. And they look at these three things as the whole book of Revelation. The stuff that John has seen is Revelation 1. He saw a vision of Jesus. The those that are is Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. And then those that are to take place after this is Revelation 4 through 22, which we would say, hey, Revelation 2 and 3 is the things that are. That's the church age, Jesus dealing with the church. Revelation 4 and on, that's the next dispensation or the next age. That is 
when everything starts shifting and changing, that's all future prophecy. Nothing from Revelation 4 through 22 has really happened yet on the um, dispensational view of premillennialism. I hope that makes sense. Now, um, the hundred. let me give you some specific examples from Revelation. Um, you may have read about the 144,000. Well, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel we read about in the book of Revelation. They're just literal. This is like, this is actually 12,000 Jewish people from each tribe of Israel. Now, the the, the post-millennialists, the one we talked about before, they may view, these preterists may view the, the 144,000 as literal Jews, but they would look at them as Jews in the first century who were the, the few who were faithful to, to Christ, who trusted in God. Um, whereas the premillennial views this as like a, a future event where God is doing a revival amongst the Jewish people and there's all these Jews who are just like sold out for Christ and it's like the fullness of Israel it, it, and it's a beautiful thing but a future thing they view the beast not as Nero in the past but as the antichrist leader of the world at the time of the tribulation he demands worship he persecutes Israel and believers he also interacts with the Jews in very certain specific ways he makes a covenant and a deal with them and he's and there's like some specific things going on there. Um, temp the the temple in Jerusalem is it's got sacrifices going on, and then that Antichrist guy puts a stop to them, all that sort of thing. Babylon in Revelation, as it talks about Babylon, is either Rome or a revived like Roman-like empire, so like a worldwide empire that has similarities to ancient Rome, or it's a final empire headed um, from Babylon, actually Babylon, which is why like some premillennialists thought it was a really big deal that. Um, Saddam Hussein a few years back was rebuilding Babylon and they were like see this is this is happening this is like he's rebuilding Babylon and um, I didn't make a big deal about it thank God because <laughs> it came to nothing um, so interestingly though for the premillennial view it requires a literal nation of Israel to actually exist because the stuff in Revelation talks about things happening to Israel and in Israel so you have to have an actual nation of Israel. You also have to have an actual temple in Jerusalem. Now, for those who don't know their history, like from 19 or from 70 AD, excuse me, until 1948, there wasn't really a nation of Israel. It was only in 1948, after almost 2000 years, that all of a sudden Israel became a nation again. And then now today we've got the Temple Institute and they're trying to build the temple in Jerusalem. So it's not for no reason that premillennialists do look at current events and think, that could be setting the stage for the tribulation. Like we've got a nation of Israel. We have, they have the temple mount. They're trying to build a temple on it. They're not able to right now. A political leader who perhaps opens the door for them building the temple could be the future Antichrist, right? Or he could not be, right? What if, what if Israel gets destroyed? Here's my thought. What if Israel gets destroyed and it's another 400 years before it ha builds up again and then, then we have tribulation? I think premillennialists lack um, historical humility to recognize that the end times should not be assumed to be before you retire. <laughs> like that's that's a bad assumption, you know, um, with understanding prophecy. But you understand this is exciting when you see Israel rise up in 1948. That's that's a, that's like adds fuel to the fire for the premillennialists. They take the millennium in Revelation 21 as being a, a very straightforward thousand year thing. The saints are resurrected. Satan's bound. Literal thousand year reign. And also, this is where a bunch of promises are fulfilled. That thousand year reign is like necessary from the dispensational premillennialists because they're going to say, look, there's these prophecies about Israel in the Old Testament and about them having like sort of worldwide um, influence and power and about worship in a much more, a much larger nation than they've ever had. And we think all that's going to be fulfilled in that thousand year reign, that earthly thing. Um, so that, that also ties together neatly some prophecies that have not yet come to pass. Now, how does the premillennialist deal with the coming soon statements in Revelation, right? It's going to happen soon. It's going to, it's coming quickly. Um, what they'll do is in, in variety of ways and in, in not just foolish ways, there are intelligent responses to these things. They say, hey, when it says coming soon, it's talking about how it could happen at any time, right? It, it could happen whenever. And once it does happen, it's going to happen quickly. And soon is meant to teach the Christians an attitude. God wants his people to be ready for him to come at, at any moment. And so, you know, Revelation is creating a proper attitude among believers to be constantly living for and, and expecting and looking for the kingdom of Christ. Um, this, however, in my opinion, is probably the weakest part of the premillennial view. And one of the strongest things for the preterist view is the, the, the soon statements in the book of Revelation. 
And um, um, let's see, there's some other things about the, the premillennial dispensational view. They'll say the church is not mentioned after chapter four. Remember, chapter two and three is is really about the what, what's now, the church age we're in now. And then chapter four and on in Revelation, it's dealing with these future things. And in chapter four, we don't have the mention of the church anymore. And John, interestingly, is caught up, right? John has the, gets these letters and then he's like, come up here. And John is brought up into heaven. And so they say John, and some would say John is like a picture of the church being raptured and caught up. I mean, you can't say that's clearly what it's teaching, but it's at least consistent with a rapture view, with a pre-trib rapture view. Um, one criticism against the rapture view is that it involves two comings of Christ because what's also clear about the rapture is we're not just caught up. We meet the Lord in the air. So someone criticize the rapture and say, you're saying then Jesus, like a yo-yo comes down. He raptures the church, doesn't touch earth and, and it's invisible, meaning the world doesn't see it. The church knows about it, right? but the world doesn't see it. They just see the absence of believers. And then he goes up and seven year tribulation. Then he comes down again with us and now he touches down. So it's like a full coming. So one criticism, kind of like the preterist who kind of has sort of has two second comings in a sense, the um, rapture view kind of has two second comings. At least some would say that that would be a criticism. I would say that the rapture view has fallen on hard times, popularly speaking right now. Um, a lot of people are rejecting the rapture view, even though many are still premillennial. Right? They're even believing in a tribulation. They just think that the rapture probably happens post-trib is probably where people are leaning more at the moment. Um, not that that should influence your thinking. I just think we should be aware. Here's why. The church should not divide on these issues. I should be able to fellowship with someone who has a different view of eschatology as long as we hold to the future coming of Christ and the eternal kingdom and a real resurrection as the Bible clearly teaches. Otherwise, I'm willing to just fellowship sweetly and enjoy other people's opinions and thoughts on these issues um, and not make it the definitional thing for my church. Um, not that I'm even making decisions for my church. I'm, I'm My main focus is online ministry now. I wouldn't have the time to be a full-time pastor to church anymore but um but i i wouldn't i wouldn't encourage people to make that their main focus in their fellowship is that their view of eschatology is like the dividing line of whether you really belong here or not i think that that's that's not the dividing line for the true body of christ why should it be for our local body um so i just mentioned those views for those reasons but um the um, another thing to mention is the, the dispensational nature of the view. It, it's like they look at prophecy. Yeah, yeah. It looks like all this stuff's going to happen at once. But basically the church is kind of like God's working in Israel. And then it's like pause. His work in Israel is paused. Now he's working in the church primarily, which includes Jews who are part of the church, of course. But then his work in national Israel like goes unpaused and it just starts again. And so we're kind of existing in a very long comma where, where it's the church age. Later on, God restarts his work in Israel. And so that's where we get this dispensational kind of flavor that goes through the uh, the view that's there. There's often... Um, okay, probably one of the most annoying things about the premillennial view <laughs> is, and I'm completely honest with you guys, is the tendency to write books and make movies that fictionalize potential future fulfillments of all of these prophecies about the tribulation, right? Like let's theorize how will we, not, not just what the tribulation is, but like how we'll get there. It's the obsession with how we'll get there that has, in all honesty, has embarrassed people for years. I remember when the mark of the beast was a barcode because they were just looked at current events and they found, let's look at the most likely current thing that could turn into the mark of the beast. And now let's act like it is. And this makes you look crazy. Christians, this makes you look crazy. You're not even basing it on the on the sound understanding of Scripture. It's just taking what's clear in Scripture and then fictionalizing how it might happen in the future, assuming that that the near future is the fulfillment of all of these things. And I think that this has caused a lot of embarrassment for the body of Christ. Not all premillennialists do this. Not all dispensational premillennialists do this either. But it has created a large amount of embarrassment. And I think that it's... Um, you know, it's one thing when you're studying about like the doctrine of the Trinity and you have these like clear lines of who Jesus is in scripture and you can conclude with great confidence about these things. But it's something else when you have uh, statements about a future and you don't know when it begins and you just guess that it's going to happen like within the next few years and you start projecting 
identities like who the who the beast is and who the false prophet is and how it's all going to happen and i just think here's the humility know that the scripture is true and that your projection of it onto current events is just your projection onto current events i am among those who have been burned out by premillennial um fictionalizing applying things to current events in ways that just I understand getting excited about the coming of Israel as a nation. I understand getting excited about the possibility of like the Temple Institute rebuilding the temple, even though that's not going to be a Christ honoring temple. You're excited because you're just like, it, it shows God's true. I get that. Not because you're excited about what's coming with the tribulation. I don't think anybody's excited about that. Um, so I, I get that. But the fictionalizing stuff, that that's where I'm just, mm, no. And so part of the distaste people have had in this fictionalizing is what's sort of led to what's called progressive dispensationalism. Now here I want to be careful. Usually when I use the word progressive, I'm usually talking about theological progressives, which is a, a category of those who very often you're wondering if they're, that's even Christian or not, um, because it often d d just splits so far from biblical truth. Others are probably thinking when I say progressive, they're probably thinking political progressives. Um, that's what the world's often talking about. I'm usually talking about theology and they do overlap somewhat, but not entirely. They're not the same thing. This is totally different. Okay. The word progressive here doesn't have any of those connotations. It's not about liberal things or anything like that. Um, but here's, let me explain what the progressive dispensationalist is all about. And if you followed the stuff I've done on prophecy, this shouldn't be that hard to grab. Let me break it down. It uses something called the already not yet. Okay, a lot of people use this, so they're not the only ones who will use this. Amillennialists will use this too. But let me explain what already not yet means when it comes to the Bible. Um, in general, in scripture, there are principles or teachings about things that are happening already, but yet there is a greater future reality for those things. So here's an example. Jesus is already crowned and ruling, right? But his enemies are not yet really under his feet yet. So he's, he's ruling, from heaven but he doesn't ruling in the full universal kingdom over all things asserting his lordship yet right we're already children of god scripture says we are already children of god but what we will be like first john tells us we don't yet know what we'll be like we'll just be like him so there's an already reality of being children there's a not yet reality we are already adopted scripture says then it speaks we're waiting of our future adoption because there's an already and a not yet going on there um, we're already perfected but we're still being sanctified hebrews 10 14. He's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Okay, so there's an already and a not yet. Now, we can take this concept of already not yet, which is not a weird concept, and it's not even controversial. Like, scholars in general are going to say, yeah, there is, there is such a thing as already not yet. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that there's a prophetic application, and I'm not the only one saying this, thank God. <laughs> there's a prophetic application of already not yet. And this is when we see what some call double fulfillment of prophecy, where prophecy is fulfilled twice. I don't think it's double fulfillment. I think that's probably the wrong term. More accurately, it is partial and then total fulfillment, where a prophecy speaks and then there's like a sort of a shadow, uh, like a sampler. Like if you go to the, to the, um, if you went to the mall, if anybody can go to the mall and they're offering you food samples, which maybe no one will ever do that again. And you eat a little food sample and you're like, I didn't get the meal, but I got a sample of it. It's the same kind of thing, but it's not the complete thing. Well, let me give you an example. In Isaiah 7, 14, we have a prophecy of the virgin birth. There's a sort of shadow, partial fulfillment of this in a child that's born shortly thereafter, right? In, in Isaiah 7. But as you read Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, you realize there's a bigger picture here where the final fulfillment, the total, the ultimate fulfillment is going to be of the Messiah. And this is what Matthew talks about. He's born of a virgin. So that's like a already not yet. In Psalm 2, we get this. Psalm 2 is actually about Solomon, King Solomon. That's that's the occasion of its writing, it seems. Uh, but it totally falls short. It's ultimately about Messiah. Why? Because Solomon is just a picture of Messiah, right? Messiah is the one who fulfills Psalm 2 as you read the details. So Solomon looks similar to Psalm 2, but the details fall short of Solomon. And when you see it falling short, you know there's a future fulfillment that's ultimately related to Christ. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. I won't read it for time, but if you read this passage, it's about Solomon but as you read it, you can't help but know it's really about Jesus. Okay, and I don't think this is this should be a controversial thing. Solomon is the son of David who's going to build the temple. He's a type of Christ. He's a picture of Christ. And ultimately, 
He's the one, Jesus is the one, who fulfills the statements in uh, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16, prophetic statements about the son of David. Why? Because Jesus is the ultimate son of David. Psalm 22, right, this beautiful crucifixion passage, it's about David, but even ancient rabbis who weren't Christians said, this wasn't really fulfilled with David, it's ultimately fulfilled with the Messiah. So this is an already not yet, prophetically speaking, I think that Revelation may have this going on as well. So this is, this is, um, this is, let me make it clear. We'll go to Revelation 119. Remember how the, the um, dispensational pre-mills, they view Revelation 119 as things you have seen as chapter one. John's also going to write the things that are, that's chapters two and three. And then those that will take place after this, that's chapters four through 22. Okay, so that's their outline for Revelation. The progressive dispensational premillennial, <laughs> I'm so sorry for all the terms, they're going to view, and this is the view that I would I would currently hold with a loose hand, they're going to say that Revelation 119 is, um, write the things you have seen, that refers to the whole book, Revelation 1 through 22. And then it separates the whole book into two types of things, the already and the not yet. Those things that are, because the whole book relates to things that are, and those things that are to take place after this, because the the real final fulfillment, the total fulfillment, is that which is still coming. So, having said all that, here's where the progressive dispensational premillennialist can say, I'm going to take what I see best in the postmillennialist and preterist views, and what I see best in the, in the premill views, and I'm going to combine them. And you might call this cheating. And you might be right, <laughs> but I think I think I think there's a good a good biblical basis for it. I think with the already not yet, the partial and total fulfillment, I think that there's a strong biblical support for that. And here's how they apply it to Revelation. They would say, Revelation, the reason why the events of 70 A.D. look similar to what you read in 4 through 20, is because they are similar. Because 70 A.D. is the partial fulfillment. But the reason why the preterist can't connect all the dots is because it's not the total fulfillment. Because the total fulfillment is going to be global, it is going to be bigger, it is going to be more like the premillennialists are suggesting. So this is, again, this is where you'd be like, Mike, you're such a cheater. And maybe you're right. Or maybe it's just the right view. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe I'll change my mind. And next, next time I do something like this, I'll be like, what was I thinking? Um, so they say, hey, preterist, you, you're seeing the already. You're seeing the already. You've just... You've just only seen the already. It's, it's like you saw Solomon and thought the ultimate son of David had already showed up. You saw 70 AD and thought that the full um, fulfillment of Revelation 4 through 20 had already happened. But it hasn't yet. That was just the partial. It was just like how David was talking about himself with the crucifixion psalm, but ultimately it fell short. That's how you know it's really about Messiah. So it falls short of 70 AD because it's really about the future. It's really about the future. The progressive dispensationalist view is going to suggest that there's still a distinction between Israel and the church, but not a dichotomy, right? You're, you're, there is no Jew or Gentile in the church, but there still is a physical Israel and they have that future prophecy. So just like the pre-mills are going to hold that, that thing. Um, Israel is going to be restored, literal millennium. Generally, they hold to a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, Daryl Bach is an example of somebody who holds this view. You could look up his commentaries on this stuff to get more details. And... Let me talk now just about, to create distinction, what's the difference, before I move on to my next view, between dispensational pre-mill and progressive dispensational pre-mill? Here are some differences. Um, the dispensational pre-mill says Jesus is not reigning on David's throne. That's a future reality. He's reigning in heaven, but not on David's throne. That's going to happen on the earth. Whereas the dispensational pre-mill can affirm that Jesus is reigning on David's throne now in an already not yet sense. And then this dissipates some of the arguments against premillennialism that classically people bring. The preterist views are rejected. The, 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 the dispensational premill is going to fight tooth and nail against preterist fulfillments in 70 AD, whereas the progressive dispensationalist is like, hey, that's great, man. That's a nice partial fulfillment you got there. And so it's probably kind of annoying for them. The um, church is not seen as a parenthesis or as a comma in the dispensational progressive premill view as it is in the traditional dispensational pre-mill view. Israel and the church are not totally separate entities. Um, that's more in the traditional dispensational view. 
they do share views, right? Israel's going to be restored. The Jesus is going to come bodily. There's a pre-trib rapture that generally is held by these people. But I do think that that's going to slide off more and more. My guess is in the next 15, 20 years, um, the rapture will become more of a minority view amongst people who are holding these things. I could, I could be wrong. I'm just guessing based on trends. Um, and I don't care what people's views are on that, <laughs> on the rapture. It doesn't matter to me that much. Um, Sorry. I know you're like, but you're a Calvary Chapel pastor. Yeah, well, I don't represent Calvary Chapel very well in this regard. Um, Calvary Chapel is a very strong pre-trib rapture. Very, very strong. And I'm and I'm not. And so please don't think I represent Calvary Chapels in that regard. Um, I, I would probably face a lot of pushback from people I know and love because of my views on, on not emphasizing this stuff nearly, nearly like uh, others would. This does lead to pessimistic tendencies. The, the, the view is that um, the golden age is coming, but only Jesus is going to bring it in. And it will be preceded by a lot of hardship and a lot of bad times coming. But generally speaking, the progressive dispensationalist tends to not broadcast theories as much partially because maybe they see that there are, there are all kinds of things in history that look similar to the events of Revelation, but the total fulfillment, we don't know when that's going to happen. And so they tend to be less... Um, woo <laughs> there's less there's less predictions about the future and crazy things that are going to happen uh, there's also what's called and i'm not going to get into detail this isn't one of my six i'm just going to mention it the historic premill this is a premill a premillennialist who believes pr pretty much all in a post-tribulational rapture and they are more replacement theology people they think the church is israel and so they don't see any of that stuff happening in the future um, okay, now let's talk about amillennialism, and I'm not going to get into more details on the historic premill views. Um, amillennialism, this is view number five. This is a five of our six. The amillennialist is a totally different category. They're not post-mill, they're not pre-mill. They're probably the most diverse. They're probably the hardest to identify because within people who call themselves amillennial in my studies, it looks like they have the most divergent views. Like there isn't as much cohesion. Preterists, post mills tend to be pretty similar. Pre mills tend to be pretty similar, not ah mills in my, in my perspective. Maybe I'm wrong there. That's just what I've learned so far. Um, they think the millennium's happening now. Not all of them. Some of them seem to think there is no millennium, but most of them seem to think there really is a millennium. It's happening now. But the, the nature of the millennium, the reign of Christ, is very different than what the pre-mill and the post-mill think. Because pre-mill and post-mill both think it's like an earthly reality. And the amill are like, this is why probably they're called amill, like meaning no millennium, is they're like, it just doesn't look at all like what you think. The post-mill are optimistic because they think it's going to expand into the world. The pre-mill are thinking Jesus is going to come, it's going to be even better than the post-mill thinks. And um, the amill are like, no, it's already happening. Like it's happening now, this is just what it looks like. It just looks like the gospel going out to the nations. and the major reigning of Jesus in the millennium is heavenly. He's in heaven reigning and the millennium has more of an impact on heaven in a sense than it does on earth. And it is a felt impact on earth. It's just the gospel goes out. It's a, it's sort of purely a spiritual reigning. Um, that'll be their view. Satan is bound now. Satan is currently bound. Um, and they defend this the same way the post mill does, um, because the gospel is going out to the nations and before the time of Christ, all those nations were pagans and unbelievers. And now so many of them know the Lord, um, the same pushbacks against Satan being bound that are labeled against the post mill can be labeled against the on mill. Um, and they'll defend it in similar ways. They believe that the millennium is measured in gospel outreach. That's it. There's no, it's not about governments and kingdoms and reigning and ruling or even health and prosperity. It's measured in gospel outreach. They're generally pessimistic. Um, so they're a little bit more like the, the pre-mills, like their view of Revelation is closer. Actually, it's kind of their own view, and but it's closer to the post-mill at least than the pre-mill. But the, um, their view of what's coming in our future is more pessimistic, a little bit more, more like the pre-mill. They're, they're looking at like, this is just the way things are as they are now. And then there probably will be sort of a time of tribulation. But what happens at the end of the tribulation is the second coming, not the millennium. We're in the millennium now, then tribulation, like when Satan's released and he gathers together the armies of the world. Like that's kind of like a bad time that's coming. Some Amils seem to think there's a seven year tribulation before the second coming. Other ones seem to think the tribulation is just what happens between, you know, the resurrection and now. Like that we've just been living the three and a half years or the seven years, depending on how they view it. It's just spread out over the last 2000 years. Others would say 
it's a future reality. I, I don't I don't know if there's a strong cohesion that I can give to that view. Um, yeah, it's just the way it is. But they do believe the second coming is future and real. There are Christians. There are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, sometimes they're preterist in their view of gospel prophecy, like the Olivet Discourse. They view that more preterist fashion. But when it comes to Revelation, they're idealist. Not always, okay? Not always idealist. Some Amils are preterist in Revelation. But the view of Revelation that's associated with amillennialism, as I'm reading some scholars on this, is idealist. Now, idealist, you're like, what is that? Um, it could also be called spiritualist. They look at Revelation in a completely different way than anybody else we've talked about has. They don't look at it as prophecy in the traditional sense. Revelation is not predicting the future. Like, that's not what it's doing. It's not telling you what will happen. It's only giving you sort of parables, prophetic parables, I might use the term, to talk about the kinds of things that happen while we're waiting on Jesus' final second coming that is real and bodily. It teaches principles of trouble and rebellion against God and eventual victory for the saints. It doesn't predict anything specifically, but it does predict everything generically. That's, that's the view of idealism. Let me read to you a quote from an idealist who's trying to summarize their views. The heart and soul of the idealist approach is that Revelation is an apocalyptic book. And let me pause. Catch that keyword, apocalyptic. See, they look at the, so the, the post mill, they use the term apocalyptic as a way of saying that the book of Revelation, these look like really bigger events, but they're really just about Israel. Why do they look so big? That's the apocalyptic genre. So their view of the apocalyptic genre seems different than the Amil or the idealist. The idealist view of apocalyptic seems to, to be that um, apocalyptic is talking about kinds of things that happen. There is no actual normal historical fulfillment for apocalyptic things. So let me read this again. The heart and soul of the idealist approach is that the Revelation is an apocalyptic book that presents spiritual precepts through symbols rather than a book of predictive prophecy fulfilled in specific events or persons in human history. Revelation does not so much for forecast specific historical events as it does set forth timeless truths concerning the battle between good and evil, which continues through the church age. When we find an event to which or a person to whom the prophecy is fairly applicable, like say Nero, when they find that, it says, we may consider it fulfilled in such an event or person, but not exhausted. The idealist approach does not mean that an event occurs repeatedly throughout history, but that the spiritual truth is timeless, finding several fulfillments throughout this dispensation. The idealist interpretations of Revelation are basically that Revelation is giving you ideas of types of things that happen, not predictions of events that will happen. Let me give you some examples. Natural disasters in the book of Revelation, they're just a representative of the various ways that God judges sinful people through natural disasters in history. They're not any prediction of any particular natural disaster. There's no historical fulfillment for Revelation. One idealist summarized the first six trumpets, six trumpets, right? Go look at the first six trumpets. Here's how he summarizes them. And this is in the book, uh, Four Views on the Book of Revelation, uh, published by Zondervan. They got a scholar to write each of the different perspectives on there. And uh, that was one of the things I read prepping for this. So he summarizes the six trumpets as, The general meaning of the first six trumpets is clear. The Lord will punish the persecutors of the church by inflicting on them disasters in every sphere of life, physical and spiritual. So in, in other words, what you get in Revelation is these large swaths of very detailed prophetic pictures that have really simple interpretations about just types of things that happen. The details of Revelation seem kind of strange on such a generalized application of the book and of the statements. Let me give you some more. The 144,000 in Revelation. Here's an idealist interpretation of that. The number of the redeemed or a, multi a multiple of 1,000 is symbolic of a large number of individuals who, in spite of the world's rejection, have accepted the Lamb and have the seal of God upon their foreheads. The number, a multiple of 12, 144,000, is also symbolic of completeness, indicating that not one member of the church will be lost. So in this view, the 144,000 is just the church. It's just everybody. So there's not a special group of 12,000, one from each tribe kind of thing. It's like, no, it just represents the church in general. This can feel like it makes the book of Revelation very flexible, right? Like it's kind of a one size fits all book. It applies to almost anything you want it to apply to. And, and sometimes it has, that's a criticism that I'll talk about in a second. The, um, the seven trumpets, 
Here's, an, here's a quote from an idealist on how he interprets the seven trumpets. The trumpets indicate a series of happenings or calamities that will occur again and again throughout the earthly existence of the church. For example, the hail and fire mingled with blood that destroyed one third of the earth is a symbol of all those land disasters that are used by God to warn the wicked to refrain from their wickedness. So it's very, very generalized. The point is encouragement. From an idealist perspective, the book of Revelation is written to encourage you to persevere in your faith, knowing that God will win and that you will be rewarded in the end. That is a good thing. You will, and, and here's the thing. You could read an idealist commenting on Revelation, and you would, even if you're not an idealist, you'd probably agree with their application. You'd be like, man, that's great application. I'm so encouraged by that. Like, that is fantastic application of the text. I just feel like you never interpreted it. <laughs> and that's kind of the major criticism against this view. Idealism is true as far as it goes. The applications are probably correct. The question is whether it even interpreted Revelation or not. Um, I tend to be the most critical of this view. Like if I was to shift views, I'd probably shift towards the, the more post-millennial view. If, if I was to shift, I, I don't foresee that happening, but it could. I, I recognize it could. Um, but probably what happens is you just you'll read one brilliant idealist. Uh, Tom Schreiner is an example of a brilliant idealist and and uh, a millennial perspective there. And um, and you might read him and just be like, man, that was so well said. Like I, I agree with him, and and that's how a view is spread. You find some brilliant person who represents the view. So yeah, uh, some criticisms about ideal idealism. It seems to be application without interpretation. Uh, we can totally agree with the idealist and then tell him he just left half the book un undealt with or half of the interpretation is not given there's an awful lot of detail here's a criticism there's a ton of detail in revelation like the colors on the armies and then the how long things last like 42 months is this and that and all these things are just sort of stretched out into sort of into, they end up being platitudes is what it feels like so the idealist view of revelation unlike the preterist or the um futurist view it just feels like there's a lot of detail there for this to be principles and not predictions. The genre classification and other rules for interpretation, they drive the idealist view. It is not, you don't get it from Revelation exactly, but like the other views, you have assumptions going in. And these are some pretty strong assumptions. Their particular understanding of apocalyptic genre to me seems like you need to, you, you need to spend some work on building that case to be that, uh, that kind of an idealist. Now, another criticism for idealism, just like premillennialism has been used to turn into like um, embarrassing, fictional, fictionalizing predictions about the future and how the mark of the beast is this and that and all this kind of thing, just like postmillennial views have turned into some people trying to establish a theocracy where really it wasn't God leading, it was them leading. And that's a criticism of post-mill views. So also idealism has a criticism. And you're like, what could the criticism be? What harm could they cause? Well, the problem is that their, their interpretation of revelation is so flexible that liberal theology, feminist theology, various views will, will take their same rules of interpretation and they will bend revelation around whatever their favorite wacky doctrine is. So a liberal theology will say, well, revelation is really about throwing off the yoke of capitalism. That's what it's really about. Right. And this is probably I, I imagine this is like what Brian Zond, what his view is, because he hates capitalism, like he hates it with a passion. And I don't really care what your form of government is, serve Jesus in it. But um, but yeah, it's about throwing off the yoke of capitalism in feminist theology. They, they'll take the idealist approach and they'll interpret revelation as if it's throwing off the yoke of chauvinism. And do you see the problem with having such a flexible interpretation is that you can bend it to your will. So revelation can easily be repurposed for whatever your theological agenda is, whether or not it's actually biblical, um, that doesn't automatically happen. There's plenty of idealists who would never do that, probably the majority, right? But it is a tendency in the doctrine, in the view, is that revelation starts to become so flexible that it just turns into whatever you want it to be. Um, let me give you another, uh, I didn't really do this yet for amillennialism. Let me give you uh, one support for it that is pretty interesting. Um, the amillennialist will say that the Old Testament passages that pre-mills, like myself, would probably look at as being fulfilled in the millennium. Remember how all those dots are connected in the millennium, all these fulfillments happen in the thousand years? They're going to say something very interesting about the Revelation, the book of Revelation, that we should take note of. In Revelation, when it talks about the thousand years, those verses where it talks about the thousand years, there's no illusion. And in Revelation alludes to the Old Testament everywhere. But there's no allusion to those millennial passages, those classic pre-mill millennial passages in the Old Testament, like Ezekiel, Isaiah 60, like these, these areas. There's no allusion there in the thousand years. 
But when Revelation talks about the eternal kingdom later on, and it mentions the eternal kingdom, there's tons of allusions to the very passages that millennialists, pre-mills, pre will often say are really talking about the thousand years. And so that does raise my eyebrows. <laughs> and I go, huh, maybe I should hear more about that view. And I think um, Thomas Schreiner is someone you can look up to get more about that view if you're interested. All right, number six, the last one we're going to look at today. And uh, thanks, you guys, for joining and being with me for this very long. How long have we been going? It's like, it, it, I guess it's not that bad. An hour and a half. I don't know. I thought it was going to be even longer. Um, the last view, and I'll briefly cover this one, is the historicist view. And the reason why I'm briefly covering it is because, like, almost nobody holds this view anymore. But it was very popular 500 years ago. <laughs> very popular. The historicist view of Revelation. Imagine you take the book of Revelation. And you, you, you take the timeline of history and you just put it right on top of the book of Revelation. That's kind of what the historicist view does, except the end of history is always right now. The historicist, more so than the pre-mill, has the tendency to see Revelation as being finally fulfilled in their lifetime. And so um, the way the reformers did this, right? Martin Luther, the reformers, they, this is they would take the view of Revelation and the timeline of history from Jesus until their time, 1500s, and they would just superimpose it on top of Revelation. So all the events of Revelation, all these progressive things, they would look for scattered events throughout history over 1500 years to fulfill those events. Now, you can kind of do this in Revelation 2 and 3 with the letters to the churches. The letters to the churches, each church is, is and sometimes they get progressively worse. It's like there's the persecuted church, like that's the early church, they're suffering persecution. Laodicea is like the, the compromised church, like maybe that represents... Um, uh, Catholicism and uh, from the reformers perspective them compromising with the world they become they become worldly um, the Nicolaitans power over the people that's the Catholic magisterium they have power over the people this artificial um, clergy laity thing going on so they would kind of superimpose it right on top this means that Martin Luther in his commentary on Galatians like he says that the Pope is the Antichrist and I'm like man he really didn't do a very good job it was 500 years ago <laughs> um, so that's a historicist view now it's not like uh, the reform people or the non-Catholics are the only ones that have had these views. Catholics have done it too. They just reversed all the applications, right? It's the reformers or the Antichrist. And so there's that as well. The problem with historicist views is that 50 years, 100 years later, you're, you're overlaying your timeline onto Revelation and things are lining up differently and you're finding different fulfillments for all the same events. And then another 50, 100 years later, the historicists are doing it again and it's all different again. And so then the group that has done this probably the most recently and is still very committed to it is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They're historicist, classically, in their view of Revelation. Initially, they were doing this like, we're talking, I think, late 1800s. If, if my timeline's right, I could have this wrong. They're laying over where the late 1800s is the final fulfillment. That's where the Antichrist is. That's where the, the stuff's going to take place. Um, now, now, that led to a lot of disappointment and... Consequently, other than the Seventh-day Adventists, there aren't really big groups that I know of that hold to a historicist view of the book of Revelation. And there's a couple reasons why. Um, the view is too flexible, meaning that it can be reworked so that every time you lay a new historic timeline over it, you find ways of making it work. The fact that you can you can do it in the 1500s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, you know, two, 2000s, that you could do it in all these timelines is proof that the view is 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 not falsifiable. And that's a problem with the view. Um, the other issue is that um, it's just been wrong so much. So Stanley Gundry and Marvin Pate in their, in their book, the Four Views book I mentioned earlier said this, thus while the historicist approach once was widespread, today for all practical purposes, it has passed from the scene. It's failed attempts to locate the fulfillment of revelation in the course of the circumstances of history has doomed it to continual revision as time passed and ultimately to obscurity. And so I'm I'm not going to do a whole lot on the historicist view because it's just more of like it's historical, <laughs> not not current at all. Um, the early, early church, we do have a strong tendency towards premillennial views, though not towards the separation of the future of Israel. We don't necessarily see that. That might be because the early church had a lot of hardship going on with Jewish persecution of Christians early on. And that created a, a sense of separation, animosity between Christians and Jews, which is a terrible and sad and horrible thing that may have affected their eschatology. They're like, we're Israel, you're done. Or maybe they're right. Maybe they just understood correctly the theology, but they were premillennial largely. 
but they're not the only premillennials. Like Eusebius in his church history, he criticizes premillennials. And uh, who, who's he? He makes fun of. Is it is it Papius? Uh, I think it's it's him or Papius, however you want to pronounce his name. I think it's him that Eusebius makes fun of because he's premillennial. And he says that Eusebius thought the, the, the millennium was like a real thousand year reign because he was stupid. <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's like what he wrote. And, um, and so, yeah, you do see that these discussions have been going on for a very, very long time. And I hold with a loose hand my progressive dispensational premillennial perspective. I do think it's accurate. Um, personally, I like it because my other studies of, of fulfilled prophecy in the Old Testament and in the New Testament already led me to believe in this partial total fulfillment thing. And when I overlaid that idea onto Revelation, it made a lot of sense. But it's an idea I brought with me. And so I need to recognize that. Uh, sometimes the views blur. Sometimes amill and postmill become indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. Um, like during the millennium, you'll 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 hear them talk about it, and occasionally a postmill and amill are describing the same thing, and you're like, wait a minute, how are your views different? So sometimes that happens. Um, sometimes a, a postmill who thinks we're in the millennium now is still looking for a, a tribulation type event, or an amill might, in particular, an amill might be looking for an actual seven year of tribulation or something similar that looks just like what a pre-mill is looking for, except no millennium after it. And so there's there's overlap, it gets confusing. Just know that when you hear someone identify their view, you gotta listen to them in detail to know what their view is. Probably the amill to me is the most varied group. One amill to another amill, it seems like there's a lot of differences. Um, and each of these views though has a myriad of different views. Please don't divide over this, Christians. As I move forward in the Mark series, this is kind of an interlude to the Mark series. I wanted to cover a variety of topics, but here's my my prophetic prediction for you for next week. It's not really prophecy. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, which is as I get into Mark 13, and we're talking about the abomination of desolation, and we're talking about the coming of Christ, and what did that look like, I'm going to go ahead and reference, here's the preterist view, here's the, here's the um, pre-mill view. I'm going to talk about that stuff, and now you have the groundwork so that that makes sense. If you want to read more on this, there is uh, two books I'll recommend you considering. One, probably the most useful book. Um, I don't know where I put it in the, in the living room, I think, but uh, probably the most useful book, though it's not complete. Okay, it's not complete, but it's Steve Gregg's book, Four Views on Revelation. It's a, it's a Four Views commentary book. Okay, not every book. There's plenty of books that say Four Views in the title. This one's written by Steve Gregg, two Gs, and or three Gs, I guess, Gregg. <laughs> Gregg. -g -g. And uh, what's nice about this is it actually, it, it goes passage by passage. So you have a passage like Revelation 1, 19, and you'll have four columns and he'll talk about four different views and how they approach that passage. That makes it very usable to reference as you're going through the book of Revelation. Uh, the shortcoming of that is that you need to know you are not getting the full story of any of those four views in that short commentary. And that's just the reality. This is a lot of complicated big picture stuff here. Um, another book that is interesting to read if you're inclined for a slightly more like challenging read is the four views book by Zondervan four views on the book of revelation is the title there published by Zondervan and each chapter long chapters written by scholars and they interact with each other's views um, that might help as well so again to to summarize did you get this if you understood me then you know this that a premillennial view has a generally futurist look at revelation Right? And they think there's a real millennium, Jesus is coming back, tribulation before that, and the rapture is debated, of course, of the timing of it, not the actual event itself. Uh, the post-mill view has a generally preterist view of Revelation, that is, most of Revelation was, a, was fulfilled in 70 AD, and now we're, we're, um, we're, we're living in the millennium, we're, we're building the kingdom of God in this world, and we're waiting for Christ to come back after we've Christianized the world. And the ah-mill view... Has, you know, puts the millennium more as a heavenly reality. It's mostly just the gospel going out right now. And it has a generally idealist view of, of, of Revelation. And that puts it as a sort of spiritualizing the book. The hyper-preterist view, everything's been fulfilled. There are no, there is no Christian hope, <laughs> ultimately. And that view is just not Christian. So I hope this has been fruitful and beneficial for y'all. Thank you for your time. Thanks for joining. And I'll see you next Monday at 1 p.m. We're going to deal with the abomination of desolation and some different views on that as we continue through the Gospel of Mark. So, uh, by the way, if you want to hear my most recent one, I'll put a link up here once I'm able to. Yeah, right there. And that will be me going through the first part of Mark 13. And I do have a different perspective on this than a lot of premillennialists that I've heard talk about about the passage. And I'm gonna, I have that there to keep people from making end times wacky predictions. That's it. That's all I got. Lord bless you.